I can see the lights of home. I can see him on that snow white throne. And I've come too far to turn back now. Are you trying to find a rest area? Amen. Are you trying to pull off on the road of life? You better keep your eye on the goal and keep your feet going forward. Amen. Brother, we're coming to the end of all that this world has ever known. And the church is getting ready to take her flight. Hallelujah. Glory to God. How many is ready to go? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know it's settled in your heart that you're going to make heaven your home. Do you know it for a surety? Is it settled in your mind? Do you know without a shadow of a doubt? Is there anything between you and the Lord? Songwriter wrote the song, Hand in hand we walk each day, Hand in hand along the way, Walking thus I cannot stray, Hand in hand with Jesus. That's got to be our walk. And that must be the theme of our walk. Hand in hand with Jesus. You know, if we're not careful, we'll lose that excitement about going home. You get so burdened down with the cares of life. You know, we used to preach about heaven talk about heaven sing about heaven but it seems like that the tests and trials of life have been so great that it's taken heaven off the table I'm still going to heaven how many believes that there is a home that has been prepared Jesus said if it were not so I would have told you but he said I go to prepare a place for you that where I am you, you, and you, and you can be also. I've got sweet heaven in my view. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, ready, God. I'm not going to let the devil and everything that he tries to do to me minimize heaven, minimize my salvation, minimize the victory that God has brought into my life. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. I'm not caving to the devil. I'm not his friend and he ain't mine. And that ain't no secret. Amen. In heaven or in hell. I'm not trying to be a friend to the devil. Praise God. The devil hates you with a hellish hatred. Yes, he does. And he'll do anything that he can to try to mess you up and trip you up. Amen. But I've got my eye on the goal. I've got my eye on the target. I know where it is that I want to go. Amen. I know in whom I have believed. And I know that He's able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. Amen. The devil's not going to cheat me out of heaven. The devil's not going to cheat me out of the prize that the Apostle Paul spoke of in the New Testament writing. Amen. But brother, I've got it in my sights. Amen. Like a hunter's got that buck in their sight. Amen. I've got one goal. I've got one ambition. I've got one determination. Amen. I've got a made up mind. Amen. That I'm going to inherit. Amen. The kingdom of God. Woo. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Heaven is sounding sweeter all the time. I may go by way of the grave or by way of the rapture. It don't matter to me. 
Don't make a bit of difference. Amen. Don't threaten me with the thought of heaven. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's why I worked for. That's why I came to the cross. Amen. I knew that there was a heaven to gain and a hell to shine. Amen. That's why I preached the gospel. Amen. Across the country. And I join in on the worship as we sing the songs of Zion. And I'll go another mile and I'll preach another message because I've got my sights set on heaven. Heaven is in my view. Glory to God. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord tonight? To feel His ever abiding presence. To know that He's here to grace us with His glory. And that the God of heaven would take time out of running this busy universe just to come down to 965 Marsh Road in Bladenboro, Kentucky and just stretch out his arm and lay his hand upon every one of us at the very same time. Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm happy on my journey. Amen. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God under salvation. Hallelujah. What a privilege that it's been to be here in this meeting this week. And only eternity will tell everything that's been accomplished in this revival. You couldn't have been any more gracious. You couldn't have been any kinder. You couldn't have expressed your love and your gratitude Amen for the ministry and for the preaching of the Word of God. Thank you again for the accommodations. Everything, ladies, you outdid yourself every night. I know you worked hard. I know you're tired. Amen. But I believe the Lord will give you strength day by day to continue. And you know what? This week I never heard one lady complain. Amen. I just heard Sister Carol say several times how much that she just loves this. Amen. And you know what? It shows, doesn't it? Amen. Ladies coming together, pulling together. And, uh, you know, I guess, I guess every church, kitchen, and every group of ladies needs a foreman. And I think uh, Brother Doug just kindly took that under his wing. Here's the foreman this week back there in the kitchen. Amen. Shouting orders and they're shouting back. <laughs> Glory to God. Well, they say every good job needs a foreman, so there you go. Hallelujah. Thank you for your giving. Everything that you've done. It'll get us to our next revival. And everything that we take in in ministry it goes right back into the ministry to further the kingdom of almighty god i uh last night a revival is always a sad night and i found out the older i get the more of a big cry baby that i am so if after the service i might shed a tear or two don't think nothing about it just say he's old and soft <laughs> praise god amen but I pray for the continuing of this church. Don't let me come back next year and your seat be empty. Don't get so discouraged that you feel like you can't go on. It's almost over. We're almost home. You got a man and a woman of God here that loves you. They have invested in you. And will do whatever they have to do to see that you make heaven your home. Hallelujah. The Lord is gracious tonight. He's greatly to be praised. Pastor, if you would pray over this message, please.
have your unction and your anointing upon this place. Dear Lord, you know our hearts, you know our lives, you know what our days are going to entail tomorrow. And I pray that you'll give us strength. I pray, Lord, that you'll give us wherewithal to focus our hearts upon you tonight and give you praise and worship and honor like it's the last time we'll ever be able to do it. Dear Heavenly Father, that you will be lifted up among your people. I pray for this man of God that you'll anoint him, Lord, with a mighty anointing. I pray, Lord, that you'll just open up the portals of heaven and pour your spirit into him tonight, that the word will come forth with power and authority, Lord, that it'll shake our hearts, stir our hearts, and encourage us in the way of the night. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you. Lord, we don't take these things for granted. All the things that are done, we thank you for them in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm reading tonight in the 14th division of the writings of St. Mark. St. Mark 14. I want to begin reading tonight with verse number 32. St. Mark 14 and verse 32. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to the disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping. And he said unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Could you not watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit is truly ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed. And he spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again because their eyes were heavy. Neither did they know how to answer him. And he came the third time. And he said unto them, Sleep on now. And take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. He that betrayeth me is at hand. You may be seated tonight. The setting of the scripture that I read in your hearing tonight was the hour of Jesus Christ's greatest trial and temptation. Jesus tells the disciples, He says, wait right here. And probably they were somewhere just within the entrance of Gethsemane. Jesus said, I want you to wait here and I want you to pray. The Bible said 
that out of all of the disciples, he handpicked three of them. And it was Peter, James, and John. And the Bible said that they went deeper into the garden. And the Bible tells us that the farther they went, that Jesus became sore amazed and very heavy. These men, these disciples of Jesus Christ, they had seen Him in times past over the span of three and a half years. And no doubt, they had seen many times the burden upon the heart of our Redeemer. And they saw the burden that rested upon His life. But I do not believe that they ever seen the agony etched across His face like they saw that night in the Garden of Gethsemane because there He was being pressed. Jesus tells the disciples, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. It was a sorrow in Gethsemane church that could have actually exploded his heart. It could have literally broken his heart. It was a sorrow that he could have very easily died from because you must remember he bore all of the sin of the world. It was a sorrow that he could have expired from. As a matter of fact, it was more than just sorrowful, but the Bible said exceedingly sorrowful. Exceedingly sorrowful. Jesus makes a request of the disciples, and he says, I want you to tarry here and watch and pray while I go pray. Jesus goes. He walks farther into the garden. He kneels down. And He begins to pray. Have you ever seen the picture of Jesus praying in the garden of Gethsemane? That picture... I do not believe correctly depicts the sorrow that was upon our Savior. Because most of the time, when the painters paint the picture of Christ in Gethsemane, they have Him kneeling before this large rock. And many times, He is sitting there in that, in that position and his hands are folded very pious and his face is turned toward the heavens and there is a light of heaven's glow upon his countenance and there he prays but church I really don't believe that was the picture that night the Bible lets us know that he prayed in such anguish that his sweat became as great drops of blood falling upon the ground it was a pressing beyond anything that Jesus had ever experienced. He prayed earnestly and his heart was filled with sorrow beyond imagination. After Jesus the Christ had prayed for an hour or so, he walks back out to the disciples and he finds them asleep. These men that had seen the agony on his face. These men that wanted to stand by their master. He found them asleep. They heard his plea and his cry for help. 
Jesus said, Will you watch with me? And will you pray with me? But when Jesus returns, He finds them asleep. And He looks at Peter and He says, Simon, could you not watch with me just one hour? Were you not able to pray and help me just one hour? And the Bible said that Jesus turns around. He goes back to his place of prayer the Bible said he prays the very same prayer he says the very same words and he said if it be thy will let this cup pass from me nevertheless what I want but whatever my father in heaven shall will and after about another hour of praying he returns the second time and he finds them asleep The Bible said, because their eyes were heavy. And neither did they know how to answer Him. I see the Apostle Peter that night rubbing his eyes and shaking his head, trying to come out of that slumber as he's attempting very feebly to wake up the other disciples. And Jesus looks at them and He said, Could you not watch with Me? And the Bible said they never had an answer because their eyes was heavy. There was an unexplainable heaviness and a sleepiness that got a hold of them that night. Jesus returns into the garden the third time and He prays. The Bible said He comes back and He finds them asleep the third time. And finally, He says, All right, fellas, get up. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. At a time when Jesus needed the disciples the most, they were asleep. They had seen the agony. They had seen the heaviness. But they were not able to stay awake. Why? Why were they not able to stay awake? I'm going to tell you why the disciples couldn't stay awake. They could not stay awake because of the power of the night. The power of the night. Amen. They were not able to keep their eyes open because of the power of the night. There was a power that night that gripped them. Amen. At a time that they never even realized what they were up against. Amen. Just a little while ago, amen, the sun began to set in Bladenboro, North Carolina. And it was the close of another day. And as it began to get dark, many of you walked into your living room and bedroom and you flipped on the lights. Amen. As you were preparing to get ready for church and come to the house of God. And while all of that is going on in your home, there was a power that began to grip. Amen. This part of the world as the sun began to go down and the shadows began to lengthen and all of a sudden it began to get dusky dark and all of the flowers that are in the field they begin to feel the power of what was slowly creeping over this part of the country the flowers that are in bloom at this time they cut themselves and they close their petals for the night the animals of the day the birds begin to try to find a nest and a place of lodging why because instinct told them that that it was time to find some shelter the squirrels begin to look for a little hole in a tree somewhere that had been prepared because they knew by nature that the sun was 
was getting ready to set and darkness was coming and there was a need for protection. Hey man. Even you and I as human beings even though this business of the sun going down and the sun coming up it is a phenomenon that happens every 24 hours. And if you'd be honest tonight, when darkness comes to our world, you step out of your house at night, you're making your way to your car, and you're like, you're a little more skittish at night than we are in the daytime. When the sun begins to set and it begins to get dark, you will unconsciously start scanning the area and start looking around. When darkness comes upon us, everything looks different at night, doesn't it? Amen. Things seem to be shaped different. And there are shadows. And if you're not careful, you'll let your imagination run away with you. And you'll end up seeing things that are not even there. What is it, preacher? It is the power of the night. I know men that work night shift. Some of them only work it for a few weeks, maybe a few months. I do have some friends that has always worked the night shift for many, many years on their job. And even though these same men may sleep during the daytime, amen, and they work this shift year after year after year, amen, about 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning, Somewhere in the darkness of the night, as the hours begin to slowly tick away, about three or four o'clock in the darkest hour of the night, even the very same men that slept eight hours that day, they have a tendency to get sleepy, amen, and to nod off to sleep because there is a power that gets a hold of them. Darkness begins to affect them. It's called the power of the night. Do you know that more people die at night than they do in the daytime? I've sat in the hospitals and so have you with many saints that would die and most of them die in the night as opposed to the day. There is a power to darkness that affects life. I said there's a power to darkness that affects life and so these disciples that they were sleeping and there is a reason why they were sleepy these are men that had a devotion toward God these were men who for three and a half years they faithfully followed the Lord Jesus the three hand-picked disciples that were called out to stand by His side at this most trying time. These that had seen the sorrow and the pressure upon His countenance and they knew that Jesus needed them like He had never needed them before. And Jesus says to them, Please stay awake. Just stay awake with me. Just one hour. Would you please pray with me in this hour? Just keep your eyes open. And could you pray with me? Jesus said to them, Don't allow yourself to fall into temptation and go to sleep. I'm going to tell you what I don't believe. I don't believe that it was the disciples' intention to fail the Lord. I don't believe that it was. I believe they wanted to stay awake. But they didn't understand the power of what they were up against. And they failed to be with Him when He needed them the most because of the power of the night. I want to tell the congregation 
of a branch church that it is night time for the Pentecostal movement in this hour in which we are living. It was night time for the disciples and it is night time in 2023 for this blood bought Holy Ghost church. And I believe that we are fighting what Jesus mentioned in his parable when he said the kingdom of heaven is likened unto ten virgins five of them wise and five of them foolish and the Bible said they were talking about his coming and together they were getting ready for his return but the Bible said that while they slumbered and slept the bridegroom came I don't know about you but this old man has been preaching a lot of years and I'm fighting sleepiness more than I have ever fought it in all of my ministry. It seems like we come to church on a Sunday night and we only get so much out of it. Oh, but we're ready to get up Monday morning and meet the challenge of the day and we want to be on our toes, don't we? Amen. But I want to tell you what I've tried to do. I've tried to practice a consciousness of God's presence in my life at every waking moment to where I can say, God, help me to be sensitive to the fact that the judge is standing at the door and the sun is going down and we're in a race against time. But yet there is a sleepiness in the church and the disciples were asleep. Amen. They were asleep. Because it's night, spiritually speaking. And they fell asleep in the garden. The law had been fulfilled. And now the sun was getting ready to set upon the Son of God. And just around the corner was going to come the day of grace. But for right now, it is still night. And the disciples are asleep. Jesus had gone and lived for 33 and a half years. It had been a wonderful day. It was a wonderful ministry of three and a half years. And I want you to know that Jesus did more to change the course of this world than any king or ruler that this world has ever known. In just three and a half years, Jesus impacted this world that you and I are a part of tonight. But now it seems that the sun was getting ready to go down and there was a Calvary and there was a Golgotha and here here he is in this place of pressing and it seems as far as the natural eye can see that this was going to be Satan's finest hour. Amen. I want to say to you tonight that the devil is a master at taking advantage of the darkness. I said he's a master at doing that. He's a master at taking advantage of those times in our lives when we step out of the bright light of revelation and we step out of his glory and we find ourselves where it seems like every star is falling out of our heaven and we look around and we say where is God where is God I'll tell you where he is he's where he's always been <laughs> He's still on the premises. He's still in control of the Pentecostal church that we're a part of. Brother, that's why we got something to shout about and to be positive about. This is a great hour of revival. It is a time of overcoming. But we don't always feel like that God's there. Why? Because the devil knows how to take advantage of the night. The Bible says that he is like a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. 
Several years ago in Life magazine, they had an article about a pride of lions. The reporters went out. They had their high-powered cameras. They had their night vision goggles. And they began to study this pride of lions. They spent several weeks watching them and watching their habits. And it didn't take very long for them to find out that it was the female lioness of the pride that was the hunter of this family. Those lions would sleep all day long. And in the late afternoon and in the early evening, as the sun would begin to set, they would watch that lioness. And all of a sudden, that lioness would begin to stir herself. And she would slowly begin to stretch her muscles. And at first, her movements were very slow and not very frequent. But she was getting ready. And she was waking up. And in a little while, that lioness would be on her feet. And her eyes would be ablaze as she looked across that open plain. She was looking and she was searching. She was motionless for a long while. And then after a while, she would slowly start taking a few steps at a time. She would begin to move away from the other members of that pride. And she would slowly make her way into an area where there was a watering hole. She took her time. With every minute that passed, the sun was setting, the shadows were lengthening, and it was getting darker by the minute. What was she waiting for? She knew that by instinct, if she was going to make a kill, that she was going to have to take advantage, amen, of the night. And so she waited until it got a little bit darker. What was she doing? She is waiting on the night. Amen. To come on. I want to tell some people here right now that you and I have an adversary and he knows how to take advantage of the dark times in our life. When we begin to slide away from the fire that's been built and we slip away from the saints of God in the church, our attitude and our attention will be directed to things that are not becoming to Christians and the devil knows when to make his move it's not when you begin to slide away and you begin not to pray the way that you know you should pray that something happens oh no the devil's smarter than that he's smart enough to realize That he wants everything at his advantage. When he begins to make his move. In your direction. The lioness. She's waiting for the time to come. Waiting. For it to get. Just a little bit darker. Church we need to understand tonight. What time that it is. In 2023. It's getting dark. In the United States of America. The common citizens. They don't think the way. That they used to think. 30 and 40 years ago. Somebody has changed. And they've traded the price tags of life. And the good old America. Amen. The God fearing America. Amen. That we have been a part of. I'm telling you right now, this world is getting ready for the Antichrist. This world is getting ready for the mark of the beast. This world is getting ready for the last judgment of this day and this hour. But on the other hand, it's still a day of salvation. It is right now a time of revival. It's a day that we all must say, Hey, we got to stay awake. Nudge your neighbor and say, Wake up. Amen. Become alert. 
we got to realize that we are the ones that's got the message and we've got the answer to a lost and a dying world. We have the answer to the darkness that's being dispelled upon this world that we're a part of. Let me tell you, it is a sad thing when a church member goes to sleep. But it's even sadder still when a preacher is sitting at the wheel and all of a sudden he begins to nod off. It is a tragedy. It is a tragedy. When you go to sleep, it's as if you are unconscious. Doctors can put you to sleep, lay you on the table, open you up, take your heart out, hold it right there in their hand, and it doesn't even bother you because you're asleep. You're asleep. They've done something to put you to sleep. Amen. When my oldest brother had open heart surgery, doctor came out with all of us. He said, Larry, he said, Dale's going to be fine. Everything's okay. He said, you'll be able to see him in a little bit. It's, everything is good. Well, I found out just because the doctor says everything is good doesn't mean it always is. I happened to be standing there when they pushed my brother out of surgery across the hall into the recovery room. And you know what? I was shocked at his countenance. He looked more dead than he did alive. And it was a fearful thing when I went in to see my brother. And I laid my hand upon his hand. And his hand was cold like ice. No color in his face. And I thought to myself, you're everything except all right. They had put him in a deep sleep. And he was so asleep. And he was so unconscious. I want to tell you something tonight, a branch, that the devil is trying to put people to sleep, sitting right on the pew, amen, of the church. I'm fighting it in nearly every church that I preach in. I'm fighting it in the prayer room. I'm fighting it in these days of evangelism. I can be in the pulpit and I can look across the congregation and I see people that's got their eyes wide open but they're sitting there asleep they're asleep I watch young people the devil is opening them up and he's reaching down on the inside of them and getting a hold of their heart and they're thinking things they've never thought before and they're saying things that they never said before and it seems like that they have become unconscious to the voice of the pastor The power of the Word of God has lost its effectiveness in their life. What's it going to take to wake them up? What's it going to cause to get them to come out of that spiritual coma that they're in? And you know what? All of us other saints, if we're not careful, we'll just get comfortable with it. Amen. Sometimes we'll allow our children to go to sleep in the cradle of our own church. Amen. I go to church sometimes and I look at it realistically. I may see a few sinners sitting out there and then I'm looking at people that claim to be safe and I know they need to pray through. And I think, what's it going to take? Is it going to take the trumpet? Amen. The sound. Amen. We get comfortable with members of our family not being where they ought to be and we just rock them to sleep in the church. We come in, we sing the same old songs, we say the same old things, and church just becomes repetitious, and church becomes a routine. Amen. I want to tell you what we need. We need God to give us a divine interruption in our life. Somebody needs to build a bonfire. Somebody needs to stir some things up. Somebody needs to get a fresh burden upon their heart. Sometimes they're not in recovery. Sometimes they're dying. And those nurses can tell in the recovery room if you're going to live or if you're going to die. Amen. The lioness positioned herself. The sun had set. And it wasn't very long. 
Here comes a zebra nonchalantly to the watering hole. And the lioness is getting ready to take advantage of the night. This article said that she could be at top speed of 50 miles an hour in just a matter of a few feet. All of a sudden, they got this burst of energy. They can't run for a long distance, but they can be at top speed in just a few seconds. And suddenly, the lioness jumps from behind the bushes and she pins that zebra by the back of his neck and before the animal knew what was going on, it was over. Jeremiah 4 and 9 says that the lion has come out of the thicket and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. Can I ask you a question tonight? Is there anybody here that can tell a difference in the climate that we are living in in America right now? Is there anybody that can feel a change in the climate of government and in the climate of philosophies? Amen. I'm telling you that this is an hour where the lion is about to come out of the thicket and destroy is coming upon the land. Some months back, my baby sister, she lay dying. The doctor said she had one of the ugliest forms of cancer that any woman could ever have. She literally had tumors. That were growing from the inside out. She couldn't lay on her back. Because her back was full of tumors. And here's how she slept. She would sit in a chair. And she had a little table with a pillow. And she'd put her head on that pillow. And that's how she slept. Everywhere you looked. There was a tumor. And it literally. Was eating her alive. I remember one night in particular, Sherry was struggling to breathe, struggling to breathe. I had just gotten to hospice somewhere about 10 o'clock at night to stay the night with her. I wasn't there 30 minutes. She looked over and she said, Bubby, what time is it? And I looked. And I said, Sissy, it's almost 11 o'clock. You know what she said? She said, I wish the sun would just come up. I just wish the sun would come up. She thought that everything could get better if the sun would just come up. It wasn't very long again. The same question, Bubby. What time is it? And I would tell her the time. Why did she do that? Every few minutes. I'm going to tell you why. Because she felt like that she could just get a better grip on life. If the sun would just come up. Amen. She felt like that she could overcome this thing that was trying to smother her. If the sun would just begin to come up. Do you know what my sister was fighting. She was fighting the power of the night. She was fighting the power of the night. I want to say to every church member tonight, it is a dangerous thing for you to walk out of the church in a day that we're living in a backslidden condition. It's dangerous not to frequent the prayer room and get slack on your consecration and in your Bible reading in the day that we're living. And when it's church time, you you are careless. I said you are careless to sit at home while church is going on and God's speaking in the church and things are happening in the church and people shaking the devil off of their back and you're laying home in front of the TV. You are careless with your soul. 
If that's your pattern, you need to change that inconsistency. And commit yourself to Christ. And commit yourself to the church. The only way that we're going to be saved in the end time is to get close to the fire. Amen. I said we're going to have to get close to the fire. Amen, church. We're going to have to flip the lights on. I said we're going to have to turn the lights on in our life. Hear me tonight. When a church starts getting dark, when a church starts losing its worship and praise, you heard him in this revival. How many times did he say, come on, people, let's praise the Lord. Because he knows when a church starts losing its worship and praise, and it's enthusiasm that somebody better turn the lights on. Many years ago, when I was pastoring, we lived in the parsonage. One night, I went out to the car and I looked up and I saw bats going in and out of the attic against a moonlit sky. And I stood there and I'm watching that flurry of activity. Bats coming and going and coming and going. Sister Peters kept telling me, I'm hearing something upstairs. She said, I hear a bunch of fluttering and going on up there. I don't know what it is. I figured out what it was. It was bats. Amen. I didn't have time. Amen. To uh, get a ladder and climb up there and try to plug the hole. It was going to take some work because it needed work. But I'll tell you what it did. I got a string of lights. And I got a big old extension cord. And I stretched it from one end of that attic to the other. And do you know what I did? I flipped the lights on. And do you know what happened when I flipped the lights on? I got rid of every bat. Amen. That was in that attic. I'm telling you, church, it's dark tonight. I said it is dark. And the devil is working on people. And he wants to open you up and get a hold of the heartstrings. Amen of your life. I'm telling you, your only answer is a red hot praying through of the Holy Ghost. It ain't time to go to sleep. It's time to throw wood on the fire. It's time to stir the coal. It's time to give some oxygen. Amen to the fire. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't get too cocky. Don't get too cocky. Ah, Brother Peters, this message don't belong to me. You're not preaching to me. Yeah. I've heard people get cocky before. Hey. That's what Peter did. Yeah, he did. Jesus tried to tell him, Stay awake, Peter. Jesus warned him. You're going to deny me. Before the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me. Do you know what Peter did? Oh no, Lord, I'll never deny you. Peter miscalculated the power of the night. Amen. I'll never deny you. I'll never deny you. There's a penitentiary in the state of Louisiana. It's got quite a reputation. And some of the men that worked there attended one of the churches that I was having a revival in. And they were talking to me one night about the men that were on death row. Many of them were just young men. And they said that the day before their execution that they were allowed to order anything that they wanted for breakfast the next morning and then after they ate their breakfast they would be escorted to the execution chamber they told how these young men spent their last night some of them boys would sit in their cell and they would be restless all night long the guards would flip the breakers And all of the lights would go out in the prison. 
But these young boys that were going to die the next day, they didn't want to go to sleep. Amen. They knew that they only had just a few hours to live. And here they were. They said they would pace back and forth, back and forth all through the night. God only knows the thoughts that were going through those young men's minds. And I don't know, maybe they were repentant in their last hours and thinking about how everything could have been different. Amen. Or maybe they were thinking about their mother, how they broke their mother's heart. Or maybe they thought about the wrong road that they took and it could have been all different if they would have listened to the voice of reason. Guards would look in on them through the night and here they are pacing back and forth, back and forth. But as the night begins to progress, they said that those young boys would begin to slow down their pace. And after a while, they would sit on the edge of their bunk and then hold their hands in their hands. They don't want to go to sleep. They want to stay awake. Something is getting ready to happen. They want to stay awake. They want to squeeze out what they can of what's left of their life. They don't want to die. They don't want to die. They're too young to die. It's a terrible thing. To watch the power of sleepiness in the dark. And darkness and quietness takes over. Nobody is talking on death row. Amen. All of the other prisoners are asleep. And finally, the guard said they've watched them. And all of a sudden, their heads would go back. In a sleep and in a slumber. Those men said it was a terrible thing to unlock that cell the next morning and look at that young boy laying there. He looks so full of life. He looks just like a kid. Just a young boy. He should have lived many, many more years. And then they said it was a terrible thing to have to get him by the shoulders and shake him and say, Get up! i got to wake you up in order for you to die. you got to get up so you can eat your last meal. They didn't want to go to sleep. No. But the power of the night began to work on them. Amen. There might be somebody here tonight that would say, Preacher, I know I'm not where I need to be. And I know that down deep inside there are things that is working on me. And I know there's things that I need to get right with God. And if Jesus was coming tonight, and, amen, then I'd really pray. And I'd really get a hold of God. And I'd consecrate myself to the work of God. I wouldn't just come to church and sit on a pew and be a floater or a spectator. Or just sit there and watch everybody. I know I'm not in the will of God. I know I'm not having the favor of God but yet I know God loves me and I know he's merciful to me if I were you I'd be afraid to meet God tonight is it going to be that somebody's going to wake you up after it's too late the sound of the trumpet the church is gone the preacher's gone and you wake up to spend eternity in hell Joshua in the Bible was in the middle of a battle that was going on. And all of a sudden he noticed that the sun was getting ready to set. And it was coming down really quick. Amen. And Joshua had won a lot of victories. But he never had half as many as he wanted. Amen. He was still alive with vision. But he needed more daylight. 
And all of a sudden, he prayed an unbelievable prayer. He said, God, I want you to cause the sun and the moon to stand still. And do you know what God did? God stuck his big fist in the wheel of time. And he stopped it. And he gave him more daylight. Brother, we've got more victories. Amen. That we need to claim. And we've got more deliverances that we need to have around here. I know there's darkness all around us. And everything is winding up. But you better hear me. This ain't no time to go to sleep. This is no time for the children of the day to be sleeping. It's time to wake up. It's time to flip on the lights. We've got too many neighbors and friends. We've got too many backslider friends that are marching their way to hell. We've got too many people in the church not living the way that they need to live. What they need is the voice of a trumpet. They need somebody to wake them up. They need somebody to run to their door like Sister Sandra did the other night. Amen. And start walking, knocking. Amen. And saying, hey, you better get up. This ain't your ordinary church invitation. Jesus is coming. If it's dark in your house, you better turn the lights on. Amen. You need a fresh revelation. You need to wake up. And realize it's not over yet. Amen. The hour is late, but it's not too late to pray. Amen. The sun is setting, but it's not too late to get a hold of God. Oh Lord, give us an old-fashioned Pentecostal revival in the middle of all of this darkness. Don't allow us to be affected by the night. Help us, God, to be world changers. Help us to dispel the night. Amen. Praise God. It's still John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's either that or hell. You must be born again or you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus said, I am the door. And if you try to enter in any other way, You are the same as a thief and a robber. He that believeth and shall be baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be damned. I don't rejoice over that. But that's the scripture. Amen. Amen. Tonight, it's getting darker in this world. And I want to say to a branch, we're living in a wonderful hour. But if you're going to have a move of God here in the future, you're going to work for it. You're going to have to strive for it. It used to be, Pastor, 40 years ago, you could go into a storefront and somebody could strum a guitar and you had a revival on your hands. It don't happen that way no more. Why? Because it's dark. It's dark. Praise God. It's dark. Somebody better flip the lights on. If you see your brother or your sister begin to wane in the night, it's time to nudge them and wake them up and say, Hey, we've got a responsibility. It's dark. The sun's going down upon our life. Whatever you do, don't be caught unaware. Don't be caught caught in a in a uh, a habit of sin, where you think you've got it all hidden. God sees it. It's time to fix it. It's time to get it right. Amen. It's time to lay it at the foot of the cross while there's still light. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the door. He's the bread of life. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We need light. We need light. 
We need light in our services. Somebody needs to fire up the lamps and get the lamp burning on the altar again. Somebody needs to get a cleaning cloth and, and clean all of the cobwebs out of the baptistry and get all of the bird nests off of the altar. Amen. And let's come together one more time and have a move of God. It's late. It's late. The hour is upon us. The sun of our life is going down and it's beginning to set. I've got more years behind me than I do in front of me and I know that. But I've determined that I'm going to do whatever I've got to do to ensure that I make heaven my home. Well, they sing tonight and we stand across the building. I don't know. Maybe there's somebody here tonight that says, Brother Peters, I, 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 I really, I really, I, I just don't know where I am right now. I don't know how I stand with God. I think I'm saved, but I'm not real sure. Maybe you might say, I know that there's some things in my life that I need to get fixed up with God. Maybe some of you young people are here tonight and you're battling darkness in your life and maybe in your school or secret things that are going on that you feel like you can't talk to mom or dad about. Why don't you let the Lord shine the light upon your pathway? If you're here tonight and you're discouraged by darkness, why don't you let Jesus be that light that will guide you and direct you in the right path? Amen. I tell you what I want to do. I want to make a general altar call tonight. And I want all of you that can to make your way to this altar. Because I'm going to tell you, the devil's going to try to make it dark in your home. And when the devil does that, you better flip the lights on. You better turn on the lights. Because we're coming to the end of all that this world has ever known or has ever seen. Could we slip out of our seats tonight? That's it. Let's come. Let's seek God. Let's call upon the name of the Lord. Lay every burden and every weight and every sin. Lay it all at the foot of the cross as you call upon Jesus.